Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Welcome to Friday PM. My name is Luigi Scarcelli. I have an extra special show tonight with my friend and mentor, <laughs> Cedric Mufarenzima. Cedric has come all the way from Rwanda to Maine, and it's a very circuitous route. It's very interesting, yeah. and he's going to tell us a little bit about it. So welcome. Good to see you, Cedric. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Luigi. Thank sure, you. Sure, sure. Uh, I've known Cedric for probably about six, seven months now. Yes. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about your, your background, your story, coming yeah. to uh, Maine from Rwanda. Yeah. So you were born, what, what city were you born in, Rwanda? Yeah, I was born in the eastern province of, of Rwanda in a, a district called Kayonza, okay. a sector called Mkaranje, read on by, by the main, main way. You know, it's, it's a very popular area. Most people pass by there going to the rest of the country. So. Okay. Yeah. So you're kind of on the way to one place to the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's so many very key, there's like a big park and then there is a very big border between Rwanda and Tanzania. And on the way there, you pass through my area where I was born in the eastern province of Rwanda. And did yeah. you say that you were born a kind of on a more of a, a rural community, like a farm almost? Or yes, I'm a country boy. I was yeah, born yeah, in, yeah. A, in a farming area. Right. My mom, her main activity was farming and uh, I grew up on fresh food, very, very when they talk about organic, I know what they're talking about. You know? <laughs> I, I, I grew up uh, eating on the food that my mom and her friends and her other people who helped her had farmed. And um, it was a big area where milk was abundant and uh, a lot of uh, agricultural products and a very uh, good essence of life, I think I miss it. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so you were uh, farming, so you were kind of uh, really in that rural environment, like capturing your own food in a sense of the farming, it was, it, it, you weren't going to the groceries for your food, you were getting mm. the food and creating it yourself. So supermarkets is a thing of the West, I yeah. believe. <laughs> right. Most people go to the ma farmer's market to get their, right, right. their food and uh, my, my mom used to be one of those people behind the counter yeah. in the farmer's market. Farmer's she grew her own food, yeah. some of it we could eat at home, but others she could bring at the public, ma at the public farming farmer's market. And uh, that's the kind of economic activity I grew up uh, seeing around. But I didn't stay in that area for a long time. I, um, well, before you jump to the sure, next chapter, yeah. uh, so was there, uh, how much of that system was in cash versus bartering? Was some bartering also? Yes. Yeah. There was so much bartering going on, especially yeah. when uh, there was uh, things that are not readily available. Let's say there is a lady in my, my, my village, she's very good with making uh, herbal medicine. If your child had like intestinal problems, she could whoop up a few leaves and, <laughs> and yeah. could give you something to drink. And my mom knew too well right. to send you there with a bag of corn, with a bag of uh, sorghum or maize as a way of, okay, you're gonna get the medicine, but bring something as well in, in exchange. But that did not remove the cash economy, like you said. Right, right. Uh, like sugar, soap, those kind of things, uh, you had to go to the local mom and pop shop, but there was no, like, the, the level of supermarkets. Hannaford is not, not, not a thing. Right, there, right. Know? It wasn't all of that choice. Yeah. And sometimes in the West, I mean, this is jumping ahead, but sure. I, I do think it'd be interesting. When you first moved to the West, were you shocked by all of the, the choices? And really, it's cho fu fundamentally false choices yeah. because it's all the same soap, but just yeah. a different box yes, of all yes. of that. Did that, was that shocking even at all to you? Yeah, or? I think one of the most shocking situations for me was uh, Dunkin' Donuts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I couldn't uh, fathom right. that you could get that level of assortment of drinks right. in one single place and, and there was two or three people making it happen. Right. In my mind, I felt it required a whole manufacturing right. Right. plant to be able to put such drinks fast and yeah. It, it was mind-boggling, and um, the only drinks I knew were the five ones, you know, right. booze, milk, right, water, right. and, you know. Right, right. <laughs> but when I saw the kind of uh, things people are able to put up Coca-Cola, then Dr. Pepper, then yes. Pepsi, and all these things, and they're yeah, yeah, very yeah. fundamentally the same. They just mm -hmm. have a different branding to mm -hmm, them mm -hmm. and small little differences in flavors. Absolutely. And so uh, did, you did a lot of the farming yourself in those days? I, I was child? a kid. I was yeah. a kid just tagging along when yeah. they went to pick up like a, a big plantain that had fallen or they had cut, picking up uh, uh, small potatoes that were like left around when people were harvesting. Um, let's say it's like 3 p.m., you're hungry, right. you, could, you could be sent to just to cut off some maize and bring home and grill for everybody. Yeah. Those are small tasks. Yeah. Um, I, adults could do the, 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 <laughs> yeah. the chopping. And, yeah. and so, what, so, for example, in a village such as this, 
What was it at night? What was the form of entertainment? Were you listening to the radio? Was there a television? Or was it that, uh, I mean, you guys weren't that far outside of, you know, uh, electricity types of things. Um, yeah. Or what, what was the types of things as a child that you remember? Yeah, you mentioned radio. Radio was big. There is uh, this big uh, kind of play. You know, when people are going, like, the dialogue of some sort. So popular. Uh, called Urunana. It was like a, a Tuesday night at uh, 7.30. Everybody would be near the radio to hear the, right. the next episode. Right. And the day after, on a Wednesday night, there was something called Umusekewera, which was like a, also like a play dialogue type of thing, right. but about romance. Yeah, so yeah, it was a little bit later in the night, around 9.30 or 10.30. Yeah. So I, I caught the bag. Like, I really liked that, and I could put my ears on the radio and hear what um what Emabre is gonna do to Uima and I have his friend. Right. Like there was always like those these little details that could tell you they could make it dramatic uh, and include some of the older stories from historic Rwanda and it was very fascinating. It was my introduction to media and, and, and arts in general. And did you have a, a large school there, a smaller school or um there was a public school and a public high school. The way it's done in Rwanda. You do six years of primary school, then six years of high school. Um, I, I was I went to one or two days to the primary school, but before that, the, the preschool was a in one whole. All kids in the same neighborhood could go just sit down there and listen to one person speak, then go play the rest of the day. So it, I didn't do too much schooling there, but uh, there was a big school there for all everybody. Basically, everybody went to the same school. Eh? Yes. <laughs> And yeah. so this was uh, at the, the smaller schools, but then uh, you had, you moved away with your dad and your grandmother on your dad's side. Is that correct? Yeah, when I was five, five. I moved uh, okay. to the outskirts of the city. Yeah. Um, it was a, it was a bitter moment for me personally. You know, like being you're know, five, then you're taken away from your mother. It kind of kind of leaves a very long-lasting impact on you. Yeah. But uh, it was for education opportunities. So yeah. I really found those because obviously a rural area. Then the outskirts, the quality of education improves. It gets better. So I, I went to the French-speaking school. They were very harsh on in French. Yeah. You had to speak French all the time. Okay. Otherwise, you could be uh, shunned, or they could put a, like a, something on your on your neck as a way of saying he was speaking vernacular. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it was even, sometimes there could be some serious consequences for not speaking the instructional language. The school was called La Source de Savoir. It was like a private school, and uh, the kids from the high middle class in that area, that's where they go. Right, right. Those who were from like, the elites, they could go to a much English-speaking school a little bit near the city. So that's where I did my primary school for six years. It was um, a very interesting experience. I knew it was better than the public schools, because obviously we had to go to school in a white shirt and a red tie. That itself, knowing that you put on a tie every day, did something to your psyche, and you could see the other kids going to the public school wearing khakis, like khaki pants and khaki shorts and khaki shirts. Khaki shorts and khaki shirts. Ooh, that's hard to say. So, like a white shirt? Or for us, it was like a white shirt and a, and a dark marine, uh, the bl um, tan pants, even? Like blue for the marine. Like right, blue, yeah. Marine like blue. Marine blue. Very dark blue. Um, and the red, red tie. Red tie it made you stand out. It made you stand out. Yeah. It made you feel different, and um, you knew there was a cost to that. So all that swag <laughs> <laughs> could end when they were sending you back to go get your school fees. Exactly. <laughs> because in private they don't mess around. <laughs> you know, like right. you either get the money on the first day of the school, or they send you back home. You back. So imagine you showed up in the morning, just like go go back. <laughs> so that was always like a very. Uh, not very fun moment. Then, the, then you could see the other kids going to the pu public school, running because nobody's gonna send them away. But they could, you know, like there was always like that uh, contracts contracts that I grew up to know how to live with and appreciate. And so was this was a a, a Jesuit school, a Catholic school, wasn't it? A yeah. religious bit, little bit based. Um, it was much more parent run, parent but run. the high school I went to was ca Catholic. Okay, so that's we'll get to that at the yeah. high school. So this mm. was on the secondary school. This is the saying. primary school, my primary primitive school. years, okay. between 5 and 11. Yeah. 5 and 11. Yeah. And in French speaking, so at yeah. this time, you did not speak English at all. No, there was no English, but there could be a course of English every now and then. Yeah. Uh, in the school, you had to learn how to say, to do, we do, I do, like the, you know, yeah. I, you, 
him, he, 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 she, yeah. those kind of v verbs, con that conjugating word. verbs, yeah. uh, building phrases, the basics. They could give us a little bit of grammar, um, singing, a little bit of singing every now and then, but everything was fundamental in French. And uh, if you could not speak French or a little bit of English, you could get very penalized for that. Yes. And I think it was net positive because obviously you are immersed in that environment where you have to force yourself to say something even if you don't know, but you keep forcing, eventually it helps. It helps. Yeah, a little bit. You know? And so uh, were you still friends with any of your friends from the village or is this kind of a, did you feel, because I, I've seen and knowing you, you have a lot of adaptability. Yes. And it, that oftentimes comes from when you've had to move a lot. Because you yeah. have to make new friends oftentimes. Yes. You're the yes. new guy at the place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that was, but did you keep your friendships? Were you good at meeting new people? Did that help you from that? Yeah, it, I think that, that, that is something that developed uh, when I went to high school. Yeah. But earlier, I, I wasn't aware what was happening. I was obviously moving places, and I didn't form these relationships that are very uh, strong with friends. But uh, in high school, because it's a place I went for six years, living in boarding school with guys like we developed relationships we started uh we, like the two guys i still talk to today more than two actually three of them three of them and this was uh, high school and that was school. so that was a boarding school yes so yes. at that time similar area as your other school or no no, no this one was more into the um, in the city think of westbrook yeah you know? <laughs> right, 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 right. yeah the equivalent of westbrook to maine okay, right? yeah, sure. that's where i went for for high school in a jesuit uh, yeah, a place you call that's where the gangs be hanging out. There was a school in the middle of there. Right in the middle of it. Yeah. Uh, like you said, there was no. It, it became very hard for me to maintain relationships from the village to the outskirts, then now to the city. The, the right. city, that's where I still think I have friends, yeah. That's where you still have friends. And yeah. that was the third maneuver. Mm -hmm. So you were there, that's six years? Yes. yes. Is that, uh, is that t the extra two years than we have in the U.S. for high school, mm. is that two years after to add additional years, or the two years starts earlier? The way, the way it works, like obviously when you're like five or six, they put you in primary school, then you do six years, 11, then you jump right away. Like there is no too much of a delay between high school and high school. You just start basically the equivalent of the seventh grade. For us, we call it high school. Then from the seventh to the twelfth, you are in high school most of the time in boarding because that's what's more, which what makes um, economic sense. Like obviously you're in one place with the same kids, yeah, I think the same thing. Wow. There is no like, um, like there is, everybody is in the same, same place doing the same stuff. Uh, depending on the quality of the boarding school you end up, that obviously determines the next moves you do, but really the, 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 the best and most cost effective for everybody, the parents, the children, is to be in a boarding school. Boarding school. Yeah, it's the standard. It's not like, um, obviously here I know boarding schools are much more... It's very uh, <laughs> elite uh, yes. and very expensive, but there that's, it makes more sense for everybody. Yes, it's, um, it's, it's an experience that actually, you know, looking back, I'm, I don't, I don't, I don't uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for that experience. And I can see the quality of a person that comes out of such right, a right. very gruesome uh, discipline. Right. You wake up at 4.30, you go to bed at 9. Right. And between 4.30 and 6 a.m., no talking. Yeah. You're just, you know, kind of meditating some sort. Right. After 9 p.m., no more talking. Yeah. Yeah, at the same time at 6.30, at 12.30, and at 7.30 in the evening. Same right. things, same time. Right. Prayer before meal, prayer after meal. Yeah. Six times of prayer during the day. It was like very <laughs> regimented, you know. Like <laughs> well, we have that here in the U.S. called the military, right? <laughs> except for the prayer part. Yeah, 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 that's definitely that's a very much they wanted to have that discipline, mm -hmm. and it, and it seems to have worked very well for you. And the idea that it, it, it shapes you as a man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and this is a formative years. You said this starts in seventh grade. Yes, yes. And it goes all the way to what we consider to 12. be twelfth grade. Yes. Yeah. And so that's that extra six years. Mm -hmm. Before we talk about your journey into America, uh, and you can always let me know if any of this stuff is uh, too, uh, too heavy or things like that. Sure. But I mean, at your age, you're 26 now. Yeah. Uh, this was really around a lot of the, the uh, war torn and post-war, really mm -hmm. more post-war yeah. uh, in Rwanda. Now, uh, what, what was that like for you as growing up? I mean, was that difficult? Uh, did you see any of that? I'm sure people ask that all the time because yes. that's what a lot of Americans know mm -hmm. about uh, Rwanda. They only mm -hmm. know the very 
uh, difficult yes. and a tragic parts. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that doesn't sum up the country. Yeah. Maybe that's not what something that you really saw that much about no. or things. But what was your exposure and, and thoughts about those days? Um, it's it's obviously I wasn't born through it. It happened in 1994. I was yeah. born in 1996. You were born. In yeah. So I was born two years after that. But it was still in the aftermath. The there was still. A, of it. Yeah. Yes. You could you could um, people could be farming and boom a bone. It's like, oh, they buried somebody here during the genocide. Then the next thing you know, there is a, every year there is a commemoration on a national level. It was a very, it's a gloomy moment. Everybody is commemorating their lo lost ones in the genocide. My mother, who, who was very impacted by it, she obviously, issues of PTSD, uh, issues of, uh, you know, being, being too close to the catastrophic. You know, like, it just happened two years ago. Yeah. You lost six of 12 siblings. You, you lost a husband, you saw people being killed, like there, there is so much trauma. And basically, for me, what's interesting is comparing how it was when I was starting to have a little bit of thought, let's say in the year 2000, 2002, yeah. then how it is today. Okay. It's an amazing transformation. Right. To see somebody growing, but it's like rising from ashes. Like you, 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 you could see your mother turning into a different being because of the moment the country is going through dark, gloomy, then after that, you could see another step. Then on the country level, you see the transformation. People are saying, let's, let's um, what they call, um, you basically getting back together. Um, there is a word for it. Reconciliation. Uh, reconciliation, yeah. thank you so much. Right, reconcil yeah. Reconciliation happening. That for me blew my mind. You could see somebody who okay, killed your family members, but I'm here to apologize. Then, you know, the burden now is on, on the person who is being asked that uh, justice must be served. You know, uh, now these people who are, um, who are giving burden, but also they have to, on a community level, take on cases. Imagine a murder case being judged by community members oh. and actually deciding a sentence of somebody on a community level. Yeah. That was happening when I was coming up. So seeing that community level blew my mind. Seeing what came out of it, imagine there was like a million cases for genocide that needed to be prosecuted. Uh, so they had to come up with a revolutionary way of doing that. And then they had to reconcile these people. Then they had to develop. We had to go to school, we had to eat, we had... You could see the power of a nation. To be honest with you, I believe in Rwanda. I think what I saw in my formative years and the way it is today, mind-boggling. Yeah. I still, th I, th I feel like for me, it gives me a moral tasks, at least to you know, to, to, to get your life to a level where you see, it's like, I'm proud of what I've come because I'm proud of the country. You know, coming from that, uh, right, it's very, it's, very, it's very inspiring, you know? <laughs> and so when you say, because so after World War II, they had a thing, it was the Nuremberg trial. Yeah. And that's where they were uh, trying all the Nazis. Yeah. So, uh, because I think you told me about this, or I might have seen this somewhere else, this community-based, uh, because it was so many people. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like they had a, you know, with some of the Nazis, they were only uh, prosecuting the higher-ups, not the soldier who was forced into it. Yeah. But it, right in Rwanda, you have, you know, so many people, and I don't know what the hierarchy was. I mean, the guy who was ever was in charge, yeah. he was probably hung or something like that. Yeah. Right? The guy who <laughs> ordered everybody. Yeah. But it was almost uh, a chaos, right? Yes. So uh, within the post-chaos, how, and I know you said it just now, but I mean, explain a little more for the viewer, how does a, a community-based judgment system work? You're oh, saying- thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the question. It's, there is a, actually a technical term for it called gachacha. Gachacha means the grass. People could sit around and they could vote uh, six honorable, truthful members of the committee. Okay. And these people could sit in the front and they could bring the uh, perpetrator in front of everybody, then the, the people could accuse the person, the person could either explain the crime or provide evidence, and everybody's taking notes, right. then now there is tract, right. because uh, everybody's speaking. There is people testifying, the person who did the crime, then there is a committee, then it will have a few minutes together. They had guidelines written up in Chinyarwanda that are specific, and everything was happening in front of everybody. Yeah. Then those documents could be transferred to the court. Then everything could be formalized. And what was the oftentimes? Uh, I'm uh, again very much guessing, but the mm. idea that w was a uh, more uh, just upon in the sense that they weren't, uh, you know, not as much eye for an eye, 
or mm. was it that where if you if you were judged as a person who may have killed some people was your punishment to be killed or was there a different level of this yeah. community judgment the capital punishment was there in the beginning right but slowly it was faded because you know uh, it, it's not the way the world is today a person despite what they have done they're, they're still a person right. you know we all have time when I kill you, I remove the time aspect. Basically, your potential is gone. So, literally, you had jails full of engineers and teachers. You don't right. do that. You don't just put everybody on the and shoot them. The, what they, they had to do was um, also there was something called TIJ, which is a, this, uh, a, a, an acronym in French. I think it's called Travaux, something, uh, works, public works. Okay. So these people who were accused of these uh, heinous crimes of genocide, they were given a task to, be, to rebuild the country. So they're the same people who build cobblestone roads across the country. Oh, yeah. They're the same people who are farming uh, uh, valleys right. of rice, people building like um, uh, soil management systems, terraces. These are all people in prison. So they became, they, they really played a big part in, in the country and everybody who could go through certain years of public works, their sentence could be curbed and they could be rejoin their family very soon. It was a very, it's a miracle, let me put it that way. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's like a creation of miracle, painful. Right. Certain people were not happy with it. Right. It's like, yo, these same pricks killed my family, yeah. now you're sending them back. Right, right, right. Like, it, it was um, a yeah. dice, and then I was in the middle of it because my mother was a survivor. And she was a survivor. And she, she, she could tell me stories of people she had to show up in Gachacha and testify against, and these same people you see, oh, then resist. And, so they, and before the... So let me just ask this, before the, the genocide that happened, were these also the neighbors? Mm. So at one time it's your neighbor, but at one time it's your victimizer, but mm. now you have to be the forgiver. Was mm -hmm. that how it had worked? Yes, because yes. everybody had all lived together. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the difficult thing. I mean, I think in some of these other things where it's uh, outsiders coming in in a yeah. war, an oppressor, but these, they, because they were two tribes, yes. the Tutsis and, and the, the Hutus, Hutus yes, yeah. and, and just for the viewers who really, because many people aren't going to know anything right, yeah. about this. So uh, at the time, when we go back to before the genocide happened, mm. who was the people that were in charge? Was it uh, the Hutus were in charge at that time? Um, you would say it was a Hutu regime, uh, yeah. according to what I read or what I saw in the history books. But uh, it's, it's, uh, it was a system that followed the... Um, the, the reign of the king. Okay. So the, the colonizers, the powers that kind of were colonizing the country, I think at the time was Belgium. Belgium. Uh, they had a falling apart with the, with the king and right. his administration. So they removed the king, then they put in a Hutu leader. That's who they put in. Uh, then there was a whole ideology that was formed to change how people could see Tutsis. Tutsis have always been a minority. Then, but it was also a, so, a social class, an economic class. It wasn't, it's something that became weaponized. Okay. It was there as a way of moving up and down. But a, yeah. the Tutsi was a, a step up? Yes, yes, So yes, that yes. would be a step up. Mm -hmm. And so which was the tribe that seemed to have went for the revenge that was the genocide? Yeah, it, it was, uh, it, they actually called was ethnic the groups. Tutsi? It was ethnic groups. It was ethnic, so. Yeah, because there was an, an element of uh, uh, anatomy, like they could say if your nose is this wide and this long, you are, you, you, let's say it's, it's this, this length and it's longer, that means you're a Tutsi, and let's say it's wider and it's shorter, all that, they, they right. came up with metrics. But obviously they start putting it in your ID. They would say so and so Tutsi. Then when, during the genocide, when you could cross like a, a border or like a stop, uh, stop, road, road stop. Like a roadblock almost. Roadblock, yeah, yeah. they could check your ID. It check, doesn't matter how you look person, like. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it was like a very weird man, weaponized um, concept. Really, you can't tell people. Like, it really, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's hard. It was, uh, I, think, I think in Rwanda, they got that whole concept from the Belgians. Right. You know, in Belgium, there's this sects, the Wallon and the Flamand. Okay. Like, they, they speak different, a little bit of different right, things, right. but they, are, they hate each other so much. Right. So they gave us a little bit of test of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they took the country down a hill. You, well, it's what they from. call a divide and conquer. Uh, so, divide at impera. It's a, yeah. it's a Latin principle. Horrible that's stuff. the idea that it will be very hard to uh, take control of a, of a unified population. Yeah. But if you take this population and you split them in two, mm -hmm. you give the smaller one the mm -hmm. guns and the money. So they're always afraid of the larger population. And what mm -hmm. happened was chaos. But it seems as though 
after the uh, reconciliation. Yeah. And, and do you find that that was all based on internal powers or was there outsiders that helped? Because it seems like the outsiders created a lot of the problems and mm -hmm. maybe the group of the people within themselves were the people that were able to reconcile it. Yeah, I think it's, it had something to do, big time to do with the good leadership. Um, like without a leader who thinks in that way, that wouldn't have happened. Yeah. It was easy for the for the leaders to say, let's revenge, let's take over, let's silence everybody, let's... But, you know, I actually think also reconciliation is a way of survival. Right. Like, if had they not been that way of reconciling, right. things would be still going down. Right, right. Like, right now, you can tell... You can even use reconciliation as a weapon. Right. Don't treat me like that because, you know, we reconciled. Right. Like, it could happen to you. Yeah, right? I, it's, a, it's a mean of, re, of survival. You have to do it. Like, right. It's not the way, otherwise it's going to be 100 years of a conflict. And this is what I think a lot of people will find interesting is your pathway to come to Maine. Yeah. Uh, so uh, tell me about that because I, I know that you were in school there and it happened that the school that you went to is Bentley College, correct? Close. Those are our Babson. Arch Babson. Yeah. Babson, <laughs> Babson Business College. Yeah. And they teach mostly business at Babson, right? Yes. Yeah. At that time, had you wanted to be a businessman? Was that something you thought about? Business was an idea? Yes. I think, I think uh, to be honest with you, if I'm to attribute where I get the bag of one, to be, one thing to be in entrepreneurial ventures from my mother, I could see her, you know, investing a little bit into getting the land ready, sowing, and harvesting them, keeping some for ourselves, then taking the rest of the market. Simple, simple right. action. She did it repeatedly, and I saw it happen so many times. So I think that's where I get the bag. But the way I ended up in America was through a, a program called Bridge to Rwanda. Uh, it, it was a, a program invent, started by American philanthropists and businessmen. They came in Rwanda, then they asked the president, what can we do to help the country? Yeah. So the president asked them, like, help, help the brightest of the country to find opportunities in American universities. Right. Excellent universities, not all of them, but the good ones. So these guys set to task and they started Bridge to Rwanda. They could attract American investors to invest in Rwanda. But these businesses, they could say, oh, we don't have the good qualified American labor. So they started training Rwandans into America. So that happened once, happened twice, happened three, three times. On the fourth time, I got lucky, I got into the program. Yeah. It, it was like a prep program of some sort. They could put you guys in a, in a room where we applied 1,700, they picked 27 of us. Then they trained us for like 18 months. Um, doing standardized exams, TOEFLs, uh, SATs. Then we did the whole application process through Common App. Something, I, I don't know if it's still there, Common Application. Common App, yeah. Yeah, so we applied to different schools. Common Core, maybe even? But yeah, 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 there's like a very weird term they use. So I, I got into that program, I went through the 18 months, I graduated, but I had contacts at Babson College through a summer program they had done in the country. Then I was like, I want to go to Babson because it's the only school I knew and I liked what I saw. I didn't want to try a lot of stuff. Because right. they told me in America there's 4,000 schools. <laughs> it's like, yeah. how do you go through 4,000 right. schools and pick one? You know? yeah. It was crazy. So I went to Babson for four years. And um, towards the end, um, obviously, you are in an entrepreneurship school. It's a business school. They're giving you everything for you to dream out of the, out of the box. So for me, I felt a moral day to really what can I do uh, being a business wise? And I had so many options in front of me, but people, people is what uh, do things. So if you don't have people, you don't have anything. Yeah. So I, I knew people in Maine, so I came up in Maine and uh, that opened the door for me to, to know about the life in Maine, yeah. uh, what people do for a living, um, what is it can I do to add value to this community that I want to join. Thank, yeah, you, so thank, you, so thank you so much. Thank you so much, I really appreciate it, man. Take care everybody. <laughs>